On the show today, we'll focus on the steps that must be taken to improve access to education for children in Africa. Now, the CEO of the Roger Federal Foundation joins me to discuss the foundation's activities here on the continent. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag, that's beyond market. You can follow my Twitter handle too, at Esther Ubudaga. Now, according to UNESCO, Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rate of education exclusion in the world, with over a fifth of children between 6 and 11 out of school, and the statistics get worse the older a child gets. Now, data from UNESCO Institute of Statistics also shows that almost 60% of Sub-Saharan Africa's youth between 15 and 17 years of age are not in school. Janine Hendel, the CEO of the Roger Federal Foundation, joins us from the CNBC London studio to discuss the foundation's activities in Africa. Janine, thank you for taking the time out to join us. Now, the, the numbers from UNESCO are quite daunting, but it's one thing to know what the numbers are, and it's another thing to actually experience this, ex this exclusion that UNESCO talks about. Now, in the, in the years that the foundation has been in existence, help us understand what the experience has been uh, so far in terms of how bad and how widespread this exclusion is? Well, as you might know, we are focusing on early childhood development. So the children one, two, three years before they're entering into primary school. And there the exclusion is tremendously. We are only at the start of a whole new development. Um, that these children have access to quality of education. I mean, we are active in the region of Southern Africa, so in six different countries, and there we have an average of 40%, 50%, maybe 60% of children only having access to uh, early, early learning organization in the country. So we really have to put an effort in that from the government side, from the public hand side, but also from the private sector side. Now you've also said that you're not working alone. Obviously you need partners to help you on this journey, especially local partners, those who uh, probably already work within the communities. Tell us to the extent to which these partnerships help you achieve a goal as a foundation. Oh, of course, alone we can not achieve anything, especially as a foundation based in Switzerland. Um, I think we are not the best actor to become active in the community. First of all, we partner directly with local partner organizations. So not through international organizations, but local organizations which know exactly the context, which know their people. But then we uh, are pretty much um, basi basing on the forces of the communities. It's a community driven approach. So we are sensitizing the community, we are mobilizing the community that finally they take in their own hands uh, the effort to provide quality of early learning and uh, good education for their own children. Now the foundation works in six African countries, uh, excluding uh, Switzerland, the likes of Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa and Malawi. And I know that you have uh, programs that are ongoing, especially in the early uh, childhood education, and you also have an impact assessment. Tell us, uh, maybe pick one or two countries, perhaps where you've seen the biggest uh, positive impact so far. Tell us about those programs and how they've been impacting on the access to education in those countries. Maybe um, let me pick Malawi because this is a 10-year long-term initiative on to establish early childhood development in the country. We started there 2010 being doing baseline studies, um, how much is the access and it was almost 20% only of children having access to early childhood development. And we, um, as part of our initiative, we established 80 model ECD centers, uh, so kindergarten, preschools there. Um, and that was the first time really that the country have seen that uh, quality, how quality education in rural Malawi really could happen. Um, and then, of course, at the same time, um, we have done advocacy on a political level, and it was only after Roger Federer's uh, visit to Malawi in 2015 that uh, the government and the parliament actually was deciding on a first-time public budget for early childhood development. Um, in addition to that, we are working in other 400 ECD centers together with the communities to increase 
the enrollment of children to increase the quality of education, so it's capacity building of um, these caregivers, it's bringing in the parents that uh, they know how to promote their children at home, so it's a joint effort. And if I have uh, one example of success, um, as the caregivers are not part of the compulsory um, formal education system yet, maybe in 20 years. So they are not paid through any governmental salary. So we need to find other solutions, how we could um, give an incentive to these caregivers that they uh, continue their very important work. So we established a revolving fund. So we gave to the communities seed money um, that they can borrow of it and the caregivers are the first one to borrow with the interest rate of 10 percent and it was incredible to see this fund is managed by the communities themselves with um, training on our side capacity building on our side and it was in amazing to see um, after one year the community was not only able to pay back the 700 dollars uh, seed money but have done a 50 percent gain on it which can be now um, uh, invested into the quality of these ECD centers and on top the caregivers have started small businesses in, uh, as an incentive for uh, their work they do in, in the centers. Now talk to us about some of the traditional beliefs uh, that perhaps stand in the way of uh, access to education. Now, I mean, I've heard that there's some communities that don't even believe, you know, the, uh, that education is even necessary in the first place. Uh, that on one hand, and then of course there's the issue of poverty. Many of these children uh, have parents that are living in poverty or are living in you know, poverty conditions and cannot afford to send their children to school. Now, coupled, you know, with you know, some traditional beliefs that, you know, hinder uh, access to education, were there some of the challenges or are there some of the challenges that you encounter? Actually, our experience is quite a little bit different. I think um, these parents, they know exactly how important education is. But if the quality of these schools and preschools is of, of such that it is not worse to send the child, then it is actually quite a small um, reflection on it um, to save that money to spare energy for the the long uh, way to go to to the school um, so once the parents um, really understand that the quality of education has improved um, the reaction in the community what we experience is pretty much that everybody uh, brings their children but of course you need to involve the parents and this is something this it might be a concept which which is new um, the schools should not be an exclusive compound for teachers and people from the capital and from government representatives actually the schools and preschools they they should be owned by the local population they are serving the people and that's why once we you bring the community on the compound once you give the teach the the parents a role in the education system, um, they accept uh, enthusiastically this responsibility and our experience is tremendous how they engage. For example, when it comes to school meals, in, we, in all our preschools we introduce a feeding program which is conducted by the community. We, we don't provide food. It is uh, an effort, a joint effort by the communities, by the parents to collect food and then to cook and prepare it for the children. In the recent report that you put out, you described 2017 as a special year, perhaps some kind of milestone that was achieved by the foundation. Could you shed more light on that for us? 2017 was one step forward in reaching out to our goal 1 million children by end of 2018 actually. So we are facing more and more end of our uh, current strategy. Um, maybe we have even reached it already now at this early age of the, of the, of the year. Um, a personal milestone was certainly that we have already looked beyond what is going after, what, what we do after this uh, strategy. So the board um, of trustees were 
Roger Federer is our president, has already approved the new strategy 2019-2025, um, which is important to really underline the long-term thinking and the strategic grant-making approach we, we are having with our foundation. Uh, you also described, um, just look, looking at the report, April 2017 was the most successful month in the foundation's history in terms of income generation. And I know that that's strongly tied to the uh, Match for Africa initiative, where I think last year we saw Roger Federer having a, a tennis match with uh, Mr. Bill Gates, and that raised a lot of money. Tell us about this Match for Africa initiative. Well, our approach uh, in funding this whole engagement of the foundation is not that we have a big asset and then we, we, can, we can live from these assets. Our approach is that we um, define a strategy of, of activities, um, so this one million children, and we know that this uh, will cost us uh, a certain amount um, of, of money. And uh, Roger is committed, uh, together with the other board members, to do everything to generate that kind of money in order to uh, being on track to implement uh, the planned um, strategy. So there are different kind of ways how we or Roger is generating this money. So it's merchandising um, uh, gains. It is uh, some from some tournaments uh, we receive um, um, money, which uh, Roger is channeling towards the foundation. But in 2010, we had a new idea that we do an exhibition match with uh, the title Match for Africa. It was the first in actually Zurich against Nadal, which was a huge success, not only in terms of generating funds, but also in these stadiums with 15, 16,000 people um, to show the joy of Africa, the power of Africa, the colors of Africa. Um, therefore, we have now um, already done five Match of Africa's, uh, two in the United States and three in Switzerland, and there are others to come. Okay, we'll take a quick break now. I've been speaking to Janine Hendel, CEO of the Roger Federer Foundation. Still with me from London is Janine Hendel, CEO of the Roger Federer Foundation. Janine, thank you for your time so far. Let's pick up from where we left. We we're talking about the match for Africa. Five have been done so far. And I was just curious, uh, when is it going to come to Africa? Oh, Roger will come very soon. Actually, uh, we are planning uh, by second half of April, we are planning a visit uh, once again to, to the southern region. Interesting that you should say that. I was going to ask you, how involved is Roger Federer you know, with the foundation in terms of perhaps active uh, activities of the foundation? Well, he is very much involved. This is why um, he actually started a foundation with his own name. He is someone who just wanted to take resp responsibility for the quality of the work uh, this organization is doing. And this is why he was not just becoming ambassador of, of, of other organizations. He really wanted to do his own thing. Um, having his values in it, having his approach in it, and having his uh, sense of quality in it. Uh, that means um, it, it, we have a very, uh, a very strong re relationship. We are, he is involved in all strategic um, decisions. He is the one who raised the funds um, coming from him directly or indirectly through his sponsors, through Match for Africa. And um, of course, um, this is his foundation. This is his heart and his feelings in it. And coming to Africa from time to time is, is part, a very important part um, of, of his job as a philanthropist to, to see and feel, experience what uh, the programs are. Um, of course, at the moment, as he's so active in tennis, he cannot travel as much as he would like to. But he always says um, he's really looking forward to the time he steps back from tennis um, to travel more often to the continent. Jenny, let's talk about those UNESCO numbers again, quite discouraging. But how hopeful are you that with the work the foundation is doing, uh, along with your partners and other similar foundations and uh, agencies that we will begin to see these numbers improving going forward. 
it's very important that we improve. Actually, there is no way out to improve. We have the sustainable development goal. By 2030, each and every child should have, have access to quality education. And when it comes to early learning, uh, each child should have had access to organized learning minimal one year before entering into primary schools. And we all together, um, business, uh, private actors like the Roger Federer Foundation and governments should, should uh, work hand in hand to reach that goal. There is no way out. This is our promise to children. We should not lose uh, another generation. So let's work on it. Now, in your experience, would you say that the governments in the countries where the foundation operates uh, are treating this issue with the urgency that it deserves? I would say yes. Governments in southern Africa, with where we are working in, they all have put early education on the top of their priority lists. But of course, these uh, budgets for um, public education are, are limited. Um, this is a tremendous effort that they, they need to do. And uh, also, they still need to be worked on the quality of primary schools as well. So th there are a lot of needs around. Um, therefore, uh, it is a challenge. And therefore, we need maybe more resources, because, for example, from the business side. Um, if, we have, if we want to have talents for our businesses, uh, we need to invest in these children when they are very young. Early learning is the foundation of all learning. A, a child which has already not really developed at the age of entering into primary school will never catch up that again. And this is why we have such bad performances uh, at grade six, for example, in certain countries uh, because of the lack of uh, early learning. Now, I watched uh, the match for Africa, the one that uh, Roger Federer had with Mr. Bill Gates. Uh, and I'm just curious, is there more that the foundation will be doing with the Bill Gates Foundation? Well, first of all, uh, these are inspiring moments, uh, in particular for Roger, to come together with uh, one of the biggest philanthropists on, on earth and learn from him and uh, share visions. Um, that is important. I mean, uh, Roger is still at the beginning of a philanthropist um, career. Um, so these exchanges, these uh, inspirations are very important. Um, second, uh, he has a great team who has embraced us and helped us to to um, organize these Match for Africa's in, in America, in the States, um, where uh, normally we are not active. So we are very grateful. And uh, so this kind of cooperation is, is very valuable for us. Um, on an organizational side, uh, well, as you might know, Bill Gates' foundation or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is more focusing on health uh, in, in Africa. So so there is not a, a real overlap about our engagement, um, but who knows uh, what will come in the future. Well, speaking about the future, the foundation currently works in six African, southern African countries. Uh, is, is there any plan or are there any plans to extend the foundation's reach beyond southern Africa? With the new strategy coming up uh, for the next seven years, the board has decided to stick to Southern Africa and that with good reasons. The, we still have some work to do there. The job is not done. And uh, South Africa is um, the home, the second home of Roger. The whole family is very much uh, linked and emotionally attached to that region. So why should we go somewhere else? Okay, for this current strategy, talk us through some of the milestones that you've achieved. I know you probably have targets uh, and, of course, uh, the successes you're, you're hoping to achieve with this current strategy. Tell us uh, the biggest achievements and milestones that have been achieved so far and, if you're, and how close you are to your targets. So at the current strategy, our goal is to improve the quality of education. How do we measure that? There are very tangible indicators. Um, a child is dropping out less from school, for example, or children are more enrolled in schools, or uh, the retention rate, 
has increased or um, the uh, attendance rate is also a very important indicator where we can see tremendous efforts in our programs um, because every child who attends regular school will also perform better and then um, I already said it, performance is a very important indicator which we measure on grade 3, grade 4, grade 5, grade 6 in order to see if our um, package of measures to improve the quality of education um, has succeeded. For me, always uh, very uh, emotional are, is the dropout indicator. Um, to see that um, in some schools we have 40, 60 percent less dropouts really means a lot. That means children which are continuing going to school instead of being at home, not learning anything and therefore not having any future. So how is it for ex that we are working on the reduction of dropout rates? This is a work we do with parents, but in Zambia, for example, we are also working with uh, children councils. Children are learning, are trained um, how to mobilize their own friends, their children in their own age, to come back to school and attend more regularly the schools. So they are actually very simple measures with big impact. But is there a special focus on girl child education? Because the girl child education have different numbers. I mean, it's, statistics have shown that the number of girls who do not go to school appears to be higher than the, uh, for boys who go to school. So is that something you've encountered? And do you have a special focus for that? Um, actually, we don't have a special focus on girls' education because the numbers, the differences or the big gaps between boys' and girls' educations only starts after grade five. So starts when, when girls are com becoming teenagers, um, when the problematic of early marriages is starting. And as we are focusing on, on younger children, uh, we don't see there uh, any big difference. So are you looking, I mean, from the funding perspective, are you looking to expand your partners, uh, your partner base going forward? Um, our approach is having very long-term partnerships um, because, you know, a partnership is more than just uh, transferring money. It is really about growing together, learning together, developing new programs together having lessons learned together it's it's really being in the same boat and therefore it's a very intensive collaboration it's capacity building on both sides um, and this is why we prefer to have less partners um, but um, to grow with our partners if ever they can absorb a, a bigger portion um, of the budget so of course, we might uh, add uh, some other partners with the time, um, especially maybe we add some more short-term uh, programs, some short-term interventions like uh, working together with coalitions in, 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 the, early learning um, in the early learning sector. Um, but uh, the number will always be smaller but it's the quality and not the quantity which, which counts. Now, as CEO of the foundation, what would you say has been your biggest challenge so far? There is not one big challenge so far. Um, each and every new community we start working in is a challenge per se. You need to know uh, who are the, the, the positive engines for change, uh, but you need also to know who are the spoilers in each community. You really need to mobilize them and, and have a breakthrough in, in behavior change and, and, and bring them together uh, in the spirit of, uh, of becoming change makers themselves. So in each community, actually, there is a little bit of a challenge in it. Maybe one um, challenge in our, in our work is um, how can we be really partners on the same eye levels with local, our, our local partner organizations? Because 
um, there is a tendency that they only see um, people from Switzerland with uh, with money and uh, less really the, the critical partner in the boat where you uh, need to um, assess together what is going wrong, what is going well. So this open, very critical, constructive dialogue, this is something our partners, they had to get used first, this openness. Um, but um, I think uh, after some years, um, they get used to it or they got used to it and uh, they all appreciate actually this open, critical, constructive um, dialogue and being in the same boat. Jenny, thank you so much for talking to us today. I've been speaking to Jenny Handel, CEO of the Roger Federal Foundation.